on comparative performances of Beethoven's 32 piano sonatas within days. And we'll do that movement by movement. And then we'll hear the complete work in one individual's conception, which you will choose, Matt. Mm. The performance you like. Oh, well, Schnabel all the way. No, no, Always? actually, I wouldn't think... No. no, not at all. Levy for the Opus 109. Well, anyway, I'm planning ahead. Well, I'm looking You've forward to me, uh, uh, the Beethoven series very much because there's many performances that I want to hear that I have not heard. In the letter that you read yesterday, and quite truthfully, I don't remember the exact phrasing, uh, it prompted me to think about... Uh, list the man and his religious, and I hate to use the word problems, but I suspect that they were. And I'm just uh, wondering really whether we could look at Franz Liszt as a basically religious man who occasionally or even often sinned, or whether he was basically a sinner who went into religion as a matter of conscience uh, through uh, feelings of guilt. Yes. Have you ever thought about that? And if yeah. so, do you have an opinion? Well, Ernest Newman called Liszt the most difficult psychological case in all musical biography, and there's no doubt he is. Uh, Liszt took his religion seriously when it was benef of benefit to him. He was, by constitution and mentality, highly religious and very attracted to aspects of Roman Catholicism. Ro Roman Catholicism. But uh, his religion is uh, complicated to discuss because Liszt himself is amoral. He seizes the moment. Here he is at Mass early in the morning, the 60-year-old Liszt, uh, taking orders and uh, just adoring this new facet of his public personality. And he's very serious about his uh, uh, church work and what he's supposed to do. But at night he's hunting the streets of Rome again. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he, he has the, the, the classic example of the spirit and the flesh, and he could never um, merge the two into a peaceful entity. Uh, at 75, he was still besieged by uh, women, and it was a uh, problem because he loved them and they loved him. Well, the uh, religion was an escape. He was... Uh, practically hysterical as a child in uh, reading the Bible and so forth. And uh, he said he wanted to uh, uh, die as a martyr. Well, many things in an hysterical century at uh, the, the 1830s in Paris and the 20s, uh, the child prodigy, the pampering, uh, He's neurasthenic, he's, uh, and yet he's extremely uh, virile. It's, a, it's just too complicated, and I'm uh, so sick of uh, psychoanalysis, actually. I just let the man be. Please let us all be. <laughs> okay, can I ask one question, though, since you brought up the, the uh, area of psychoanalysis? Uh, that was about the time in Vienna that... Uh, that Freud was starting out, did uh, any no, of No, no, yeah, oh, you mean the late, late years Yeah, of, the late uh, years. Uh, did any of the early uh, practitioners of psychoanalysis have any theories about Liszt? I mean, obviously, uh, some of them must have had an opportunity to, to observe them. In the 20th century, uh, uh, psychiatrists have worked on Liszt and have been questioned about him, and uh, they come up with the Don Juan complex mm -hmm. and the latent homosexuality and all of this stuff. I just think uh, uh, he, his track record is what was, mm -hmm. and uh, when asked uh, why he hasn't written his autobiography, he said it was enough to have lived it. Remember, there's an element in list of such a superb showman that uh, many of his acts, which we would consider uh, neurotic, were planned out. He liked it. He mm -hmm. liked shocking you. Uh, when uh, Diaghilev first met Cocteau, he said to the young poet, Astonish me. Hmm. Well, Cocteau astonished people forever after, and Liszt astonished people. Well, I'm grateful that he did, because it's not every day we're astonished, that even if it's in a, uh, in a realm where we can say it's insincere or whatever. Who cares? He was a fantastic personality, and his music is a fantastic 
uh, glorious segment of 19th century music. Think of how characteristic his place is in the 19th century. The without him, show, yes. yes, without him in a hundred... He's the inventor in 1839 of the piano recital as a solo entity. He invents the word recital. They laughed at him in England. How can you recite on the piano? Uh, he has duels with the other great pianist at the time, Thalberg, uh, at a mad princess's home in Paris for charity, either uh, her uh, Polish refugees or Italian. She was an Italian princess. She was uh, an amazing woman, and she got together Thalberg and Liszt for this duel on March 31st, 1840 or 36 or whatever, and they played away, and there was a draw, but all of the poets and painters and aristocratic ladies said, yes, Liszt is the, uh, uh, Thalberg is the first pa uh, pianist in, uh, in Europe, but Liszt is the only one, and that seems to be the verdict. <laughs> Uh, there was then, no verdict. Though. Then, right, he, he, he loves royalty and he loves women that write books and uh, he gets the princess, a very wealthy uh, woman from Russia, and uh, he leaves the concert uh, world. He becomes a um, champion of other people's music. He, uh, uh, he, he um, becomes... Uh, has a very interesting relationship for 12 years with this lady who writes 24 volumes after she found out that he, she could not marry Liszt, that she couldn't get an annulment, uh, she becomes uh, secluded in Rome, and she lives in her uh, room where you had to be ventilated because she was terrified of uh, air, and she had these extraordinary gowns of all types of colors, and uh, she had her printing press there, and she pursued her great work on the 24, in 24 volumes of the inner causes of the outer weaknesses of the church or whatever. And uh, each book, of about a thousand pages. The hmm. Princess uh, Wittgenstein, Caroline. He was drawn to other people who had the same flair for the dramatic. Right, and she, uh, although she gave uh, up hopes of ever marrying Liszt, especially after he became the Abbe Liszt, he, uh, she still had her 14 pieces of sculpture of Liszt in her, in her <laughs> rooms with her printing press, and uh, she drank uh, cognac and strong cigars, and so did Liszt, and he would make uh, guilt pilgrimages to her. Mm. He was very pleased to be free by now. Mm -hmm. um, that possibly was one of the reasons he became uh, the Abbe List. But let's begin now with... Uh, a performance of a transcription of Liszt's, uh, of a Schumann song, Spring Night, Frühlingsnacht, in a performance by Josef Levin. It's a masterful transcription of Schumann's song, and it is a performance that must be heard. Thank you. 
Spring Night by Schumann Liszt, transcription of Schumann's song in a trembling performance by Joseph Levine, and I have to hear that again, and I hope you won't mind. Schnacht of Schumann Liszt, and Edmund Morris writes, an extraordinary feeling of nostalgia hides the virtuosity of this performance by Levine. In these two and a half minutes, Levine achieved more than most pianists do in a lifetime. Truly one of the very great performances by Levine, and will break for a moment. In 1854, the great George Eliot visited Liszt at Weimar, and she writes, About the middle of September, the theater opened. We went to hear Ernani. Liszt looked splendid as he conducted the opera. The grand outline of his face and floating hair was seen to advantage as they were thrown into the dark relief by the stage lamps. Liszt's conversation is charming. I never met a person whose manner of telling a story was so piquant. And then uh, the next day or so she uh, goes over to um, Liszt's home and she describes the princess and how tastefully dressed she was uh, in some semi-transparent robe. And <laughs> uh, But then, she says, then came the thing I had longed for, his playing. I sat near him so that I could see both his hands and face. For the first time in my life, I beheld real inspiration. For the first time, I heard the true tones of the piano. He played his benediction to God in the solitude. There was nothing strange or excessive about his manner. His manipulation of the instrument was quiet and easy, and his face was simply grand. The lips compressed and the head thrown a little backward. When the music expressed quiet rapture or devotion, a smile flitted over his features. When it was triumphant, the nostrils dilated. There was nothing petty or egotistic to mar the picture. 
George Eliot speaking of Liszt's playing. It's very strange that uh, there should be a mention of uh, the benediction, which uh, you laughed when I said it the other day, but that I thought that that was the single greatest work I'd heard uh, in it, music. And yes. Of course, I qualified it by saying that uh, I was disregarding all the early impressions of, uh, you know, hearing a Beethoven symphony for the first time. These are all youthful things. But uh, as a reasonably mature listener of music, I must admit that the benediction of all the works that we've played on this list series is the one that impressed me the most and impresses me actually more than anything else I've heard in a long time. Uh-huh. Well, I did not mean to laugh at you as... No, no, no. I mean, I understand when we talked about it. I course. happen to, you know my opinion of the benediction to God in the Solitude, one of Liszt's neglected masterpieces. And I was just uh, startled by your, your grandiose comment that that was the greatest piece of music you've ever heard. Well, I still feel that. And I hope, you know, one of these days to add it to my record collection, which I haven't done yet. And Do try you have to an get the Ernst Levy performance. Of course. Do you have an opinion as to... Uh, Obviously, one can't say this or that is the greatest single list work, but do you have uh, perhaps a list of five or six list things that stand out as being uh, true masterpieces? I think his most influential work, as well as being a supreme musical masterpiece, and I think it's Claudio Orao who calls it Beethoven's 33rd piano sonata, and that is Liszt's own sonata in B minor, which we'll be hearing as the last work on this series in a performance that's staggering by Ernst Levy. Levy again. As yeah. also we will hear one by Horowitz. Well, it's strange own. because of uh, all the Beethoven opus 109s that I've ever heard, the Levy is the one that stands out. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a tremendous artist. Mm -hmm. Let's now go on to another list transcription and back to his great love, and that alone is certainly a, a psychological relationship of, <laughs> well, just the Wagner list relationship is madness itself. Let's hear the spinning song from Wagner's Flying Dutchman, which Liszt transcribed around 1850. And the performance by Louis Kentner.
song from the Flying Dutchman. Let's stay with Wagner for a few more minutes and hear his transcription of
the artist Alfred Brendel in Liszt's transcription from Tannhäuser of the Pilgrim's Chorus. We'll be back with David Dubal in just a few moments. Well, Matt, uh... Oh, let me read this from Liszt's friend, none other than the great lyric poet Heinrich Heine, who was a wonderful cynic and an observer of people. And he writes, he asked a doctor whose specialty is women, whom I question as to the fascination which Liszt exercises on his public. The doctor smiled very strangely and at the same time spoke of magnetism, galvanism and electricity, of contagion in a sultry hall filled with innumerable wax lights and some hundreds of people perfumed and perspiring of histrionic epilepsy, <laughs> of other phenomena and other unmentionable matters which I think have to do with the mysteries of the bona dea. The solution of the question, however, does not lie perhaps so strangely deep, but on a very prosaic surface. I am sometimes inclined to think that the whole witchery might be explained thus, namely, that nobody in this world knows so well how to organize his successes as Franz Liszt. And it's getting back to what we were speaking of before. This mm -hmm. complicated man was also a very shrewd image builder. And not that's something that uh, was out of fashion for a long time. Yeah, Coming back now. Yes, it was out of fashion because we went into a very prosaic scientific age. And he was only in the beginning of the luxuriant materialism of the 19th century. The piano is just another example of this luxuriant materialism. And as we uh, became more warlike, uh, we became more serious. Not to say that the 19th century wasn't the cause of all our problems. Are you implying that maybe that since we're going into a similar age again in this century that the piano will be improved upon? <laughs> Technically? Yes, I hope that the piano, in an age where everything is made to uh, not last, I hope the piano survives as uh, an instrument of whatever quality it's attained. That worries me. Not only the piano, other instruments. Mm -hmm. Yes, I don't see improvements. I see declines. Well, I can't talk about that because I don't play the instrument. Well, it's just like automobiles and the, the mm -hmm. built-in obsolescence of everything. And uh, no, I haven't seen any improvements. I haven't seen any improvements in a long time. Now, uh, you're smiling because you have a brand new record and uh, it was through your efforts that we have it. And uh, it's, and I'm not going to play it all, Matt, because there's no time, but uh, it's the first movement of Liszt's transcription of, of all things, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, and it's for two pianos, and who are the performers? They are Richard and John Contiguglia, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yes, it's on a new uh, quadraphonic connoisseur society album, and, uh, well, we must hear it. It will certainly be strange. The first movement of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, transcribed by Liszt. Thank you. 
Richard and John Contaglia in the first movement of the Biggie, the Beethoven Ninth Symphony, transcribed by Liszt for two pianos. I was going to say that you're doing the thing a complete injustice, that it just begs to be continued. But, you uh, really think so, huh? I, uh, I hate I to hear the Ode to Joy. I'm, in fact, I'm frightened to, but uh, <laughs> perhaps we will. Um, we'll continue with Liszt tomorrow. You know, it's very interesting to hear an orchestral work on two pianos. Uh, much to learn. I remember when I first heard the Rite of Spring in its two piano version. It was It's supposed to be so revolutionary, and yet I found out that Stravinsky learned so much harmonically from Debussy. As I was listening to this Ninth Symphony and the opening, my goodness, of course Mahler was obsessed with the Ninth Symphony. We'll continue tomorrow. Thank you for listening. You've been listening to a musical...